Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Chris Franken, who's here to share with us her new book, Wild Hearted Purpose. Embrace your unique calling and the unmapped path of authenticity. So Chris Franken is an award-winning author, intuitive, mentor, and facilitator. She's a cocoa-obsessed wild woman, certified meditation guide, and energy healer, women's circle and retreat facilitator, and ritual and ceremony teacher. Chris holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and sociology and over 15 years experience as a professional writer. She has written for many print and online magazines, including Real Living and Cosmopolitan, and is also the author of The Call of Intuition. So welcome to the show, Chris Franken. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you for having me here. Oh my goodness, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. I've got to find out what inspired you to write this. There were a lot of threads that came together to create this book. I was not expecting this book to turn out the way it did. So I'm a mentor for people on their sole purpose. I do that, you know, like one-on-one with people. I've been doing that for a few years. And when I first started, I realized that I was working with men and women all around the world and they were, you know, they were experiencing um, a real sense of loss along their career path along their purpose along they were lacking fulfillment and although every single person had a really different story they were in really vastly different circumstances what i realized was that there were a lot of common threads and this started to intrigue me i am psychology sociology trained so i love um i love it when people sort of <clears throat> open up their minds to a different way of being and they get really curious about things. And then I get really curious about, well, wait a minute. So if this helps a few different people who are in very different circumstances, maybe this could help everyone. Maybe this particular <clears throat> journal prompt or this ritual or just this story that I wanted to share with people. So I thought, I really feel like there's a book here and it's, uh, and it's, hopefully able to help a lot of different people under a lot of different circumstances who are just feeling like maybe they would like a little bit more fulfillment in their career or a bit more sovereignty in in how they live. I believe purpose is so much more than a job or a career. And that was one of the main themes that I was able to share with my clients was how do you live? Because that's your purpose. How you have your, how you experience and how you share your heart in everyday moments. That's just as much, if not more of your purpose than where you show up for work every day. So rather than thinking, oh, I need to finish this job that I'm not in love with and find one that really lights me up. For a lot of people, there's this really interesting bit in the middle. (laughs) It's like a bridge in a way, but it's a really great place to be. And you don't have to leave your old job in order to be fulfilled. You can find that actually by living on purpose with an open heart in everyday moments can actually just shift your entire world so much so that the old job kind of leaves itself and the new job kind of just finds you. It's kind of magical. And that was the magical element I wanted to bring into this book, not such a practical book about goals and plans, but more of a how is your heart feeling and and how do you listen to your heart and um where does your heart want to take you so that was the that was the original intention of wild hearted purpose was to really share it from that sense of how do i live more wild hearted because that's living on purpose i think a lot of times when people hear that word wild they're like ooh does that mean i'll be out of control and what what does that really mean? So could you break that down for our listeners? Yeah, thank you so much for asking. That's really true. A lot of people think that wild is, is like to live wild means that you have to live in the middle of the woods <laughs> in a tent, you know, with no, with none of your little creature comforts that we all love. You have to give up the iPad. And, and what it means is 
for me anyway, I really feel like it means to live authentically. When you live authentically, you're not living according to anyone else's plans for your life or maps or ideas. You're not living according to anyone else's guidance unless it really does align with your heart. So to live wild as I see it, you can live in the middle of a city and you can have all of your gadgets and you can live in the middle of the country and have none of that. You can live however you wish, as long as it's authentic, as long as it is true to who you are on a very deep sense. And there's a sense of um, this word rewilding, which I love. And I really feel your question though, because I know a lot of people think rewilding is fine for someone like me. I live on 40 acres in the rainforest outside of Byron Bay. Like, but I, I, (laughs) and as much as I do talk to my chickens and the pythons that live here, and as much as I do live in many ways, a very wild life, I'm, I'm only ever doing what's true for me. And I think authenticity is, is such a beautiful anchor point to come home to each day or each week or each cycle and say, how am I going? How am I honoring me today? How did I, how can I honor, honor myself today? What is it that I need and I desire and I want? And how can I bring more of that into my life? It sounds so selfish. And really there's a, there's a sense of selfishness in, in living wild because it, it really does bring home the idea of so, a, a sovereign being living in accordance with with their truest essence. You almost lost me there at the pythons. So, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I understand what you're talking about. I mean, how often do we really want to this, to get this place where we, you know, want to live and be as our heart desires, not as the world tells us that we should look and package ourselves like. Exactly. There is so much, conditioning whether it's conscious or unconscious of how how to be a woman how to be a man how to be a parent how to do anything there are so many people who just want us to and and there are so many people who have this this passion to tell you about their way because it worked for them you know this is how they parent and it's just brought them so much joy or this is how they do their gardening and it's just made things so much easier for you. And there's always a moment available to us to pause and say, how does that feel for me? How does my body reacting to that? What What is it about that that I could really take on and what can I let go? Or do I take it all on or do I let it all go? And so by really being mindful in each of those moments and conversations and when we watch the news, if we watch the news and read magazines and listen to podcasts, every way that we are soaking up information from other people, it feels easier just to sort of do what other people are doing sometimes. But then there's a total loss of authenticity and that's where we feel quite stagnant or unsatisfied with our life. I think many people can relate to that and it kind of brings me back to your book, which all this is about your book, but one, you start with chapter one, imagining your wildest purpose. And for those people who maybe it's a struggle to not just let loose, but even envision what their wildest purpose can be, how would they even start? It's so interesting because I'm really glad you brought that one up as well. My husband has been trying to read <laughs> my book since it came in and he, since it came out, sorry. And he, uh, he's kind of struggled with it because he's really happy in the job that he does. And he's really happy with everything else he does around his job. He is in a very big time of pivoting, but it's like a long-term pivot. And so he's reading the book thinking, well, how do I, what am I envisaging? And I've been talking to him about this very thing this week. And it's like, take one aspect of your life that you would like to reimagine. It could be it could be your garden, or it could be um, your spiritual life. It could be your creative life. It could be something artistic that you wish to bloom on the side. And so, um, it, in a sense, for him, it was like bringing to life this spiritual aspect of himself. And so, just imagining imagining the process of the book in one aspect of his life that he is actually ready to 
breathe some newness into some fresh, alive, like a new life force is coming through and he can feel it. And I think for most people, there's always an aspect of our lives that we are, uh, that we're feeling that there's maybe a little bit of staleness or a little bit of um, kind of low energy that we really want to reinvigorate. It could be health could be friendships, relationships. You can take the book and then you can begin by envisaging. I'm just imagining there's a part of the book which talks about vision boards. And so I'm just imagining like I used to have a vision board that was just for my spiritual life. And and I started to put things up there that I, and the images were all about how I wanted to feel spiritually and and of course, the spiritual life has nothing. <laughs> ironically, has nothing to do with what's actually in these images. So if you wear crystal beads on your arm, that doesn't make you spiritual, but it does actually help me personally connect to my energy, connect to my spirit, and that's important for me. I do love crystals. So I had all these images. There was a cup of cacao. There was a picture of like a statue of the goddess. There were some flowers. And to someone else that might seem completely uh, frivolous or something they couldn't relate to, but in a way that's the point. No one else is meant to relate to your vision board, right? So I would have these vision boards and I would have many sometimes um, all over the place. Some of them were very small. Some of them were in my wallet. Some of them were up uh, behind my computer screen so I could look at it every day while I worked. And the point of that was, which is the point of the book, is that how do I just inspire um, what I'm wanting to step into, not necessarily what the future looks like to me, but what really is available to me now that I'm wanting to step into. So I feel like wherever anyone is at with their career, they can still take this book and apply it to any aspect of their life that needs a bit more uh, reinvigorating. I know you talk about how our words are in many ways magic. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about that with our listeners. I've had this love affair with words my whole life. I love playing with words and feeling words. And that's what I do as a writer. I will sit and stare at my word document for a long time while I try and figure out what is the best word for that feeling that I'm trying to convey in this book or in this uh, blog post or in this Instagram post. And I will, and I, I feel words in my body. And to me, that's the magic of a word. Some people can hear a word and break it apart. I think those people who really have that strong hearing sense are the ones who are great at other languages because they break apart words to their core meaning or their, or their, their different parts to see what they mean and where that, that word came from. And other people are quite visual about words and so they can look at a word and think, oh, I love that word gratitude. Doesn't it just flow? Whereas if I hear the word gratitude, I feel where is gratitude in my body and what is where am I at with gratitude today? Do I feel really distant from gratitude? Am I really owning gratitude? Do I sit closely with it? I mean, I could do this for hours. I don't think that's necessarily a really good thing because I get lost in my own in my own world of words. But what I remember beginning of high school, I had such incredible English teachers that I I just was so grateful to be actually learning about words and poetry and Shakespeare and all sorts of different writers. And at home I was reading Stephen King and Dean Koontz and all these other incredible writers, which you wouldn't necessarily read for school, but um, I wish I could have. So words, words when they're crafted with a mindfulness and attentiveness, they can convey something to the reader that that uh, that can really move them. And so a sentence crafted with and a, a sentence, if I write a sentence and it just lights me up, I think, wow, I really hope that touches a reader or a few readers. That's that's my that is my goal and that is my gift, I really feel. And so when someone is reading that, they might see it or they might hear it in their mind or they might feel it like I do to really get a sense of 
what is being conveyed because words are these magical portals that take us into a whole sensory world where we can access so much wisdom that goes beyond the word. And if we're really mindful about it, we can take back words that have been, you know, in a way made to seem not so positive. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I wish I wish I could, but words that um, words that sort of have a, a denser vibration to them, where actually we could really lift that up, like a weed. Maybe weeds are medicine to me, but to a lot of people, a weed is something that needs to be destroyed. It's really annoying. It's getting in the way of the perfection of my garden. And I've been there. I understand that. Absolutely understand that. But when it comes to a weed, I start looking weeds up on these apps on my phone and I think, what's this chickweed? What's this? Is, is this dandelion or is this um, cat's ear or is this, you know, I, I get really curious about weeds because there's so much potent medicine. So when we take words back, we're actually taking so much more back. Like our vocabulary is definitely this, this infinite um, multi-dimensional portal to really, really share how I feel about words. It is so vast and there is so much power really that we can give to ourselves when we, when we use the words that we like to use. And when we, there are still words that I don't like, and you can take back words, you know, like when people say shotgun, because they want to sit in the front of the car, like my kids and I try and come up with different words for that because we really we don't like I don't want to say shot I don't want my kids yelling out shotgun in a car park you know like that's just I live in Australia we don't have guns readily available as as you do in the in the US and I'm really grateful for that but I still like to keep certain words out of our vocabulary not to not to limit us but to in fact give us more of a creative access to words and that's why I love them so much can always do wingman like Top Gun, right? Right. That's it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but words do make such a powerful difference. And it's it's interesting just your the, your approach to how our purpose is intertwined, our sole purpose is intertwined with the nature. And I'm just so curious as to what prompted this connection. The connection to nature was really interesting. In the beginning of my writing process, I wanted to start the book, and this is chapter one in the book now, and I wanted to begin the book with a um, with the idea that you don't need to go where everyone else is going. In fact, you can go the opposite way or you can go you can go your own way. And I was really stumped at how to portray that in a way that could really inspire people. And I started to write it as this, and that's the first adventure. It's the first journey of the book, The Adventure in Nature. There's a lot of journeys throughout nature woven into the book, but I was only ever meant to write one. And that was the one at the beginning, which is putting the reader in the place of this person who adventures throughout the book. And, and the first adventure is basically you're walking along this hot asphalt paved road with all these other people crammed alongside of you and you're all going in the same direction and you don't even know where you're going because you can't see ahead. You can't, you can't hear everything's such a buzz. It's so noisy. It's so hot. It's so, you don't even know what's going on and you're in a bit of a daze the wild calls you and in the middle of all of that, you step off the asphalt path onto the grass. No one else is doing it and so you hesitate and you take your shoes off and then you start walking and your feet are being massaged by the earth and it starts to rain and it's just this beautiful journey that really sweeps you out of the everyday and into the, the, the magic and the mystery and the unknown of the wild. And yes, there are snakes in the wild and yes, there are, there are deadly spiders in the wild and yes, you know, but I, I cover all of that through the book is how to meet nature with a sense of love and trust. And, and so that was the first journey of the book and I thought, no, that, that really helps me to articulate what I'm trying to say 
in terms of, hey, every single person on this earth is a sovereign being. Do you feel like you're on this asphalt path not really having a say in your life? Or do you feel like you're actually out in the wild? Even a little bit is is enough. It's a good place to start anyway. And then as I was writing the book, I kept having conversations with people and they would be talking about waterholes and rainbows and storms and and dusty deserts and all these beautiful, mm, the, the most beautiful parts of nature just kept coming up in conversation. And I thought, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> this is Mother Nature saying, keep going, <laughs> keep using me. And so I would sit down at my computer and I would just connect to Mother Nature, Mother Gaia, and I would just say, can you, uh, can you show me like how to weave like a rainbow into a story that actually helps people? And it just, it doesn't sound like it would make sense. And the book is definitely not overly logical, but but I, w- I was able to see the beauty and the, the deep, deep wisdom that is found in nature actually does impact because our bodies are nature. We are the earth and we have this consciousness that Mother Earth shares with us as well. And so to be able to to be able to take people on a on many journeys throughout nature, that's a really subliminal, almost subconscious way of exploring the natural realms within each of us on an individual level. Following each journey, there's uh, some wisdom or a story or something that I really wanted to share that works with that journey. So that's more of the the conscious mind, giving your conscious mind something to anchor into. And then at the end of that, in each little section, there is either a ritual or a journal, journaling. And the point of doing all of that was to actually then embody that whole process. So it's all very layered in its psychology and its um, and its tangibility and 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 the accessibility. So that if you didn't really get too much from the journey, that you could get something from the ritual or vice versa. Yeah. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Chris Franken in regards to her new book, Wild Hearted Purpose. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Every day, pets are surrendered and abandoned. For these helpless and hurting animals, Paws Humane Society acts as a voice for the voiceless, providing hope for a brighter future. You can make a difference in the life of a shelter pet. Become a humane hero today. Just $10 a month will provide much-needed food, shelter, medical care, and love. It takes a community. It takes heroes like you. Together we can. Together we will. Together we are Paws Humane. Visit pawshumane.org to be a hero in every animal story. Are you an actor, public speaker, or an executive telling your story over Zoom? Jean-Louis Rodrigue and Scott Weintraub's new book, Back to the Body, takes the process they use to coach top Hollywood talent like Margot Robbie, Jack Black, and Ki Hui Kwan and makes it available to everyone. Using your body and its energy as a point of departure, your work will gain an enhanced level of performance and depth. Back to the Body, Available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Chris Franken, who's here sharing with us her new book, Wild Hearted Purpose, Embrace Your Unique Calling and the Unmapped Path of Authenticity. I mean, there's so many people out there that, you know, they hear about our life purpose and may struggle with those type of words, kind of like how earlier you mentioned your husband's in this position where he he has his job and he likes it. But a lot of times people are like, okay, well, I'm happy with the job I have. 
does that mean I'm living my purpose or is there something more that's calling me? What a beautiful way to unpack the career as well. Thank you. By by looking at someone who's just who who has a job that they love. And I have a job that I love, which is writing and everything that comes with writing. I, I absolutely adore being on podcasts and everything that comes with the launch of these these books that I've that I've put out into the world. And I really do love that. And then but then the, but then there's always other things in my life because I can't just do one thing at a time. <laughs> so there's always other things in my life where I think, well, how is that going? And how, how am I really tending, like when my children are in bed and I have an hour or two at night, like what is it that really feeds me when I'm sitting on the couch alone or with my husband? What is it that really feeds and fuels me? Because as any parent will know, that the time that you get to really <laughs> drop in and nourish yourself is quite limited. I also think for people who aren't parents, who just have very busy jobs and very long hours in a job perhaps that they do love, they come home at night and what is fueling them in those really precious hours? Maybe it's in the morning or maybe it's in the evening. And sometimes there's this sense personally anyway of I'd like to explore yoga on a deeper level because that gives me this sense of satisfaction and um, and really exploring my edges physically. And I don't push myself. I used to push myself in my 20s, but I'm in my 40s and I don't push myself physically anymore because that gen generally backfires. But I like to go for long walks and I like to do yoga. And the more I actually honor that calling and what that gives me, it, it is something that lights up everything else that I do. If I start the day with a walk, that will affect my entire day and everyone I interact with and everything I do for my job. But my purpose isn't just about my job, isn't just about these things that I write and these other things that I create. And I have these women's circles that I create as well. And what a women's circle does for me goes beyond what any job could do. Sitting or hosting a women's circle or a retreat is something that, that gives me such connection and such vitality and such healing. And so I honor that. And I have regular cacao circles. I haven't had them in a little while, but I'm looking forward to them starting up again soon. It just really feels like it's something that is so so necessary for me to feel like I am living my fullest life. These women's circles, this this exercise, these um, these camping trips that I do with my kids. And so, if I didn't, so for example, if I didn't like camping with my kids, then then we could we can kind of change that so that I feel really happy about what we're doing. That's the point of living wild-hearted. It's not just living selfishly and saying, I will only stay in hotels or I will only holiday this way. Uh, living living wild-hearted has this beautiful selfish uh, element to it, which I love, which is what do I need? And maybe I can go camping and there are certain things that I need from that camping trip that I can provide. Maybe it's a certain kind of Ah, I don't know. What do I do when I go camping? I need to take my cacao and a little stove. And then if I can wake up and have a little cacao in the morning and listen to the birds while we're camping, I'd really do feel like, okay, well, I've, I've done something really special for me and I've taken care of me and this feels really good. So I think it's weaving in those little things or just creating an entire something on the side. If, if it's whatever that looks like to you, whatever that looks like when you are reading the book, hopefully the book is going to inspire you to then say, actually, this is the kind of thing I'd like to do on the side. And also this is the kind of person that I'd, I'd like to be more authentic in this job that I love. Maybe there's something else I can bring to this job that I love. And oftentimes when we have a job that feels really mediocre, when we start to act authentically in that job, the whole vibration of the job changes and it becomes more about being of loving service and, and acknowledging that this is a job that for now is actually really working for me, not just financially, 
but it's providing me with great relationships or it's providing me with a great learning experience. And when you change your your vibration, your thoughts around the job, your attitude and all of that, then you get to receive something that can be really valuable from that job. So, yeah, there's many different ways of, of looking at that. Um, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think that's really important to note. So why cacao? Why is that so important to you? <laughs> I've, I've had a, um, I've been quite joyfully obsessed with chocolate since I was little and I'm Canadian. My dad, when we lived in Sydney in Australia, that's where I spent most of my time growing up. I also lived in Melbourne and in Detroit, Michigan. So I've had, I had quite a colorful childhood, but when we settled down in Sydney, my dad would travel to the U S a lot and he would bring back chocolates that we weren't, that we didn't have available in, in Australia, like Hershey's and Reese's peanut butter cups and all these things that I was um, quite happy to receive at that age. So my love affair with chocolate has always been quite strong. And when in 2020, when we had a bit of a, um, a bit of a stay at home time and a few of the cafes just closed temporarily, I thought to myself, well, where, where am I going to get a good hot chocolate from? <laughs> so I, I went out and um, bought all the ingredients I needed and I looked up online to find the best recipes and I just played with this hot chocolate because hot chocolate is, cacao is one of those things that gives me this, and I'm not sure if it's the, if it's just the, the mouth feel or if it's the minerals that I get from cacao or if it's, if it's a connection to a past life, I really don't know, but I really feel something that nothing else provides. It's just joy and bliss and groundedness and everything all in one. And when I started to explore hot chocolates at home, I thought I really actually want to just use cacao. I don't want something that has been um, processed too heavily into this product that we call cocoa. So I started to play with cacao powder. And then this beautiful friend of mine gave me a block of cacao paste used in ceremony. And so I had to look that up and I was trying to make the best cacao. And it really, it took me quite a, quite a while. And then in the beginning of 2022, I held my first women's retreat. And I, in, in that retreat, I held my first cacao ceremony. And I had been attending just a few cacao ceremonies that were uh, hosted by other women. And so I was learning. And it's like what we were talking about before. It was like I was watching what everyone else was doing, taking whatever resonated with me, and then creating my own cacao circle from that. And so by taking people, uh, by taking these beautiful women on a journey into their heart center, which is just about um, a guided visualization while we're sipping cacao, where women can move through a beautiful um, crystal temple that's in the middle of the wild and you go downstairs and it's all very psychological and Jungian in its ideas about exploring the subconscious, exploring, because that's where the heart is, it's in the subconscious mind. So when you can use symbols and and bring in different spirit guides or spirit animals or uh, different different um, tangible aspects of Mother Earth like flowers and rocks and different plants and the elements and brings this really rich experience. And I thought at the time, I really don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> but I really feel I could not feel more on purpose if I tried. I'm in this beautiful shala, this wooden shala in the hinterland of Byron Bay with these women who are sipping cacao and I'm guiding them through this, you know, psychology-based, beautiful journey into the heart. And I just felt so wildly lit up by the whole experience. And then afterwards, when everyone was sharing their experience and sharing their stories, I was like, no, everyone really got it. Everyone really got something profound. And that's because of the medicine of cacao. And that's because I'm living on purpose and expressing my purpose exactly how I feel like I need to, feel like I want to. So that really um, shifted everything for me, actually. That was quite an amazing experience. And since then, hosting cacao circles with women, I really love how cacao is so grounded. It really helps me to feel very grounded. 
it's not just a high. It's not just a, oh, I'm high on all this strong cacao. But it helps me to feel so connected to the earth and it and and it's been used for thousands of years to open the heart. So then I feel very expansive in my heart center. But also if I am able to sit with other women or if I can sit with some sound bowls or a meditation, then it actually takes me higher into the into the realm of spirit into the higher dimensions so i don't know anything else that does that there are many plant medicines around the world i mean you could sit with a cup of rose infused tea that will do a similar thing but it won't get it will never i don't believe anyway give you the depth that cacao can there's something about cacao and i that we, we, we were just meant to be and so i just love exploring that medicine ever, ever since the retreat in many different ways personally and and as a group. Well, I don't think there's any woman on the planet that's going to argue with you on having chocolate, you know? So <laughs> especially cacao when you have it in a way that is so organic, it doesn't have any of the impurities that I think a lot of times people are concerned about. There is a, there is a lot that happens with cacao on the way to becoming a chocolate bar. and. The chocolate bar looks, you know, beautiful and chocolatey, but there isn't a whole lot of medicine left. And so I feel like that's why at times in my life I have been eating a lot of chocolate just because I'm craving this, this medicine. And the medicine is there in the tiniest bit, but with all the sugar and all the additives, it's, it's not medicinal. You can find beautiful chocolate that is made with cacao powder and that doesn't have any numbers in it, doesn't have any additives in it other than just real whole foods. And that's the kind of chocolate that I like and that I recommend each to their own, obviously. But um, pure cacao is something that actually will satisfy your craving for chocolate, at least for a day. But <laughs> it will it will give you something that a regular chocolate bar can't, for sure. In your book, you talk about rituals of abundance. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about that with us, because I think a lot of times when people, especially now, we have so many people that are going, gosh, I can bring, I really need to bring some more abundance into my life, but also having that spiritual aspect, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion there. That's absolutely true. There can be a lot of confusion when you are living a humble, spiritual, mindful, conscious life when it comes to abundance and, and money. And I really find it so important to every day acknowledge the abundance that I have around me, even if I don't have a lot of money in the bank or available to spend frivolously or to spend on chocolate. Or I really, I love, I love what happens in my life when I take time every day to be grateful for what I have. And I feel like that is actually what abundance is. Abundance is, is an is an inner acknowledgement of all that is within and around you. You know, you can ask anyone who's been through long-term uh, health problems and they come out and they heal and they feel so vital in their being. They feel more abundant than someone who's just won a million dollars, right? There's this sense of this, this inner gold that we have when we are healthy and we take it for granted when we're healthy and that's okay too you know we we take it for granted and we and we ha and we eat things maybe that aren't great for our body because our body seems to be handling it or and then we we focus uh, externally on what we don't have and okay i'm going to call in abundance because i don't have much money i'm going to call in abundance because i don't have um the 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 things the the objects or perhaps i don't have the the, the social standing, whether it's social media standing or whether it's actually in your community or in your city, you don't have the particular standing that you had hoped to have by that age or by that um, part of your career. <clears throat> so I feel abundance needs to be really, or you can just break it apart and say, where am I abundant? And just tune into that feeling. Tune into the feeling of, how abundant you are in your life and and what is it about your body your mind your spirit your house your friends your your hobbies 
what is it about all of that that brings you that sense of abundance? Friendships are one of the most, like a really good, trusting, joyful friendship is is something that obviously money can't buy, but it's so much more than that kind of material sense of abundance. So when you have good health and when you have good friendships and you you have access to good food and you have access to clean water, you are really you're really living an abundant life like right now. It's such an amazing place to live. And when you actually feel, this is the thing about abundance, as soon as you feel completely satisfied with your abundant life, then other things will start to find their way to you, opportunities or money or just whatever it is that is that is that that you are open to receiving will find its way to you. So if it's if it's money, like you can work on money with a money coach and you can learn how to be really comfortable around money and tips for having money in your wallet and looking at money and talking about how money feels really safe around you. And that's all actually really valuable to do if you feel like you have money blocks. I, I think that's a really great process to take on is just to really just sort of, you can hold money and you can say, wow, I just, I feel really comfortable with this money. I love money. Money is so fun. It helps me help other people. When I spend this cash, the other person who receives it, they get all of this cash and they get to do something with it that brings them joy and I get to receive something from it. So there's lots of different ways that you can turn around your thoughts to be open to receiving more money or to be open to receiving more opportunities, whatever it is that you're desiring. But I think first, the first step is to come back inside and say, hey, wow, look at this life. Like not everything is perfect. It's not meant to be because, you know, the natural world is is quite chaotic if you look at nature. It looks fairly chaotic. So I don't really think us as humans were meant to have everything perfect. That kind of feels like it's a bit stale and a bit stuck to me anyway. So I don't think perfection is ever um, a driving goal it's more of a, a joyful experience of life and to find where that joy already exists, where that abundance, that health, that vitality, that light, where is the love in your life? Is there love? Focus on that. That will lift you up and it will change your vibration and it will take you to a higher state. When you're in a higher vibration, then all these beautiful high vibratory elements of life are just going to come and they're going to find you. I think that's such a beautiful place to come from, being in that gratitude for what we have. And it's so often do we forget just how how much we do have. And I think even coming from that place in gratitude of what we currently have, roof over our head, food on the table at today, cold air blowing in our homes, whatever it is, these the simple things just really mean so much when there are so many other people that may not even have that. It's so true. And it's a beautiful place to start. And I think it's also really important that when we look out to the world, we think, wow, there's a lot of people who don't have access to this, this, and this. But just to make sure that there is no, there's never any guilt or shame on your part for what you have, because that limits your abundance, that limits you because you feel that brings your vibration down. You can feel shame is the lowest vibration in all of the emotions. So when you start to feel shame for what you have in your life, like, why do I have so many black dresses? I don't know. I just, but I, that's just how my wardrobe looks right now. And and I'm not going to feel shame around it. I think it's quite funny. Um, it's not like they're all, you know, a thousand dollar dresses. They're very cheap, <laughs> but there's no shame around like what has accumulated in my life. And I feel like whatever accumulates is probably going to be moved along to a different place. I'm sending some dresses to the op shop or I'm selling them. This is just a frivolous example, but don't feel any shame about what you have and don't compare yourself to other people. You can look out into the world so that really does help you to feel grateful, but don't let shame linger or sneak in because it's it, it does that. <laughs> it, it, it really, it's interesting when we just look at simple things like that and how just slight changes can make such a difference. What do you think is some of the most profound changes that people can make to really get into this place where they're living their life purpose? One of the beautiful ways you can do that very simply is to wake up in the morning 
tune into your heart. And you can do that by actually putting your hands on your on the center of your rib cage, like right in the middle there. That's connected to the vagus nerve. And if you can actually just push in there, just really gent- a gentle, gentle massage, you might actually feel your vagus nerve stimulated and your body comes into rest and digest mode. And then you just take a deep breath and you can just feel into your heart space. You, everyone feels their heart differently. You might feel your physical organ beating. You might feel this energy that is around your rib cage or within your rib cage. Tune into that because that's that's your wisdom. That's your beautiful, intuitive, wild-hearted wisdom right there. Tune into that and say, how am I feeling today? How am I? How did I sleep? Like, how, how am I? Do I feel restored? What is it that I need today? What is it that I desire today? Who, who is on my mind today? Who do I need to, who would I like to connect with today? Is there anyone who might perhaps benefit from a phone call or a text from me? It's these really simple things and then you can get up and have your usual breakfast and see your family or whoever you live with or your animals. You can get to your job or you can work from home or you can be creative or you can rest. You can go about your day. But having that one morning ritual of tuning into your precious wild heart and discovering what is in there that that wants to be heard and that's that's you it's not some other voice coming through your heart that's you it's this deeper access to you it's not the ego saying oh hey why don't we do this and why don't we do that and you don't do enough and i never sleep enough and you know that's relentless the heart is more of a feeling but it can come to you in messages and in symbols and you can receive this wisdom and you know that it's from your heart because it's always loving. It's not going to complain. It's going to be, it's going to be a loving voice that is positive and that feels like you. So you'll know that that's you. And then just listen to and honor that voice as best you can throughout your day. It's a really simple ritual that anyone can try and anyone can make that you can make that your own ritual you can sit at an altar and have some incense burning and and have some beautiful music playing and then the whole experience is going to be so enriched or you can on your morning walk you can find a place to sit and you can sit you know where there's a cool breeze or you can sit in the morning sun whatever it is that you need and then you just tune into your heart and close your eyes it's such a gift that you give yourself when you begin to tune into what wants to come through, what wants to be heard, what wants to direct and guide you from that place of love. How about the people who have gone through extreme trauma in one sense or another? How can they trust their heart at that point? If you've been through a lot of trauma and you're still not feeling safe in your body or safe in your city or safe in some aspect of your physical domain then so that's your that's your gut that's your that's your lower your root that's your connection and if you don't feel safe then you're right it's very difficult to hear your heart if you're not feeling safe whatever that trauma looks like to you whether that's from the last few years whether that's from childhood if you don't feel safe where you are it is it's hard to live wild or to uh, connect into your heart's wisdom. So I would suggest doing everything that you can in order to be and feel safe. And and whether that means at, for you, for one person, it might mean moving to a different place because they don't feel okay in this particular city or neighborhood that they're in. And I know that's easily easier said than done for a lot of people, but that might be the case in order to feel safe. It might mean leaving a relationship. It might mean uh, connecting with a, a, a counselor or a psychologist or even a, a, sh- a shamanic practitioner, someone who's really able to, to see you and to see where you're at and to help you in tangible ways and maybe even in psychological ways. And if you really do desire someone to help you with this, then then ask your friends, ask people, because the best practitioners are those I find anyway, who are recommended by friends, recommended by people who had um, the experience that they needed with them. 
So, so feeling safe is, is, is your number one priority if you still feel traumatized. Um, and that can be a really long journey. So be patient with that journey if you're healing trauma. Um, and also know that shifts, miracle shifts can occur when you connect with a practitioner who is aligned for you. They could be a kinesiologist, they could be a massage therapist who happens to, you know, tend to your body in such a way that you just feel like you're you're home and you're safe again. So yes, if you do, if you still experience any kind of trauma, then really take care of yourself in every imaginable way because that is your priority now. Is there a practice or ritual or I know you do journeys as well, something that you'd like to walk us through? This is a, a practice that I love to do and it's actually helped me. So we had um, floods in this area in the end of February 2022 and um, it was incredibly traumatic for everyone that lived in this area. We all went through a lot and I feel like a lot of us are still are still healing from that. And one of the practices that has helped me along the way is is sitting in nature and, and when I'm feeling something really charged, some some kind of anger or frustration, I'm feeling like the, there's a deep injustice or a deep unfairness with whatever, society or a friendship or something that's going on, um, or I feel just maybe an even an everyday kind of stress, but it's building up and I can feel it build up. I like to go out in nature, bare feet if possible, and 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 sit in nature and then I'll look around and there'll be something in nature that is willing to take that from me. Now, if you believe in this practice, this is an ancient shamanic practice. And if you believe in this practice, then it will maybe you don't even have to believe fully in it, but if you feel connected to this practice, so you pick up a rock and you ask it permission, can I give you this anger? Will you will you transmute this for me? So it's not that the rock's going to be stuck with this anger. You're going to um, give the rock your anger and then the rock is going to transmute it back into love. And nature is the great alchemizer. It's it's whatever we give her, it, it is fertilized because we do it with a loving intent. So you can take a rock or a leaf. I like to take a rock and I breathe my anger into the rock three times and then I, I say it is done and then I throw it into uh, some water, fresh water, or I bury it in the ground and I sit as long as I need to and I give thanks that that beautiful, um, wise, we, we see a pebble as just a pebble, but that's not, that's a being. A tree is a being. Flowers <laughs> flowers are alive in more ways, I think, we'll, than we'll ever fathom as a human being. And they'll take it from us gladly. They'll take it all from us if we give it all over. That's why three breaths and then give it away and then just let the peace come and find you and fill you up. Let nature come and fill you up with everything that you need and then feel that alchemical reaction within your body because your body is that rock. Our bodies are the trees. We are the earth. We are are the same. So you can feel that within your body. I've never done this and experienced like a nothing afterwards. I've never done this ritual and then thought, oh, that didn't work. There's always this sense of, wow, this big shift within my being. And so as much as I recommend therapists and healers to help you every time, you know, you feel stuck, I also deeply recommend go to nature and and let her love you, let her really love you. Thank you, Chris. That was just beautiful. My goodness. I just loved your book, Wild Heart Purpose. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? My website is chrisfranken.com. That's K-R-I-S-F-R-A-N-K-E-N.com. You can find out all about uh, what's coming up. It's spring here in Australia. I'm in Byron Bay. Um, so I'll have some online offerings coming up really soon, some online circles, and, um, you can find my books, you can find my Oracle cards, you can find free meditations. There's a lot to explore there. So I'm also on Instagram if you'd like to connect there as well. Well, Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. 
Thank you so much, Marianne. I really appreciate it. This has been such a beautiful honor. Well, thank you, Chris. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Wild Hearted Purpose, Embrace Your Unique Calling and the Unmapped Path of Authenticity. Wild Hearted Purpose is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere books are sold. And remember, support our indie bookstores. If you don't see it on the shelf, just ask for them to order it. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.